Hello, and welcome to our sermon series of the One African Team of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. My name is John Hartman. I'm a missionary serving in Zambia, Africa. God's word for our meditation today is recorded for us in the book of John, chapter 21, reading verses 15 through 19. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because John or because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were younger you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, Follow me. We bow our heads in prayer. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters of our resurrected Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we know that people of different professions use different tools. In fact, when we think of a surgeon, we think of the tools that they use, such as a scalpel and sutures. Or we might think of a mechanic who works on the cars. They use spanners. Accountants, what? They use numbers. If I see someone walking down the side of the road with a spirit level in their hand, then I can be quite sure that they are a bricklayer. If I see someone with a saw, then I think that they're a carpenter. Doesn't matter what kind of job we do in our lives, we who call ourselves Christians have a special tool that God has given us to use. He's given us the keys. Now I realize that we don't find the term ministry of the keys or the king, keys of the kingdom of heaven in our reading here, but we do find them in another spot when another time Jesus was talking to his disciple, Peter. I'm going to turn back right now to Matthew chapter 16. In this section, at this time in his ministry, Jesus had asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And then he narrowed the question down. Who do you say that I am? Who am I to you? And Simon Peter answered in verse 16 of chapter 16 of Matthew, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but my, by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So here we see that term, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus talks about binding things or loosening things. Elsewhere, Jesus gave these directions to his other disciples as well, these keys of the kingdom of heaven. And in the upper room, before Jesus was arrested and, and uh, put to death, Jesus told them what these keys would actually do. When he said, if you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So in other words, 
the keys of the kingdom of heaven are like a key that either locks a person up or locks the lock that locks a person up or releases a person, loosens a person, releases them from their sins. We are locked up because of sin and locked away from God. But through Jesus, we're going to find out that we are loosened, that we are forgiven. Jesus not only gives these keys to his disciples, but we will find out that he gives these keys to us as, to us as well. Now, we know that we all use keys. I think we do anyway. We probably lock the house when we leave it every time. And that key is so important for us to get in and to get out of our house. But the key that we're talking about today is much more important than a piece of metal that we use to get into our house. And we're talking about the king, key to the kingdom of heaven. And a heaven is such a great place compared to where we live right now here on earth. So today we want to look at this key that God has given us, that Jesus gives us, the key of the kingdom of heaven, unlocking, which unlocks the gates of heaven. In our reading, we have Jesus asking Peter this question three times, do you love me? And maybe before we look at what Jesus does here, we need to look at what happened between Peter and Jesus earlier. These words that P Peter or Jesus speaks of Peter here were spoken on the shores of the Sea of Galilee after Jesus had been betrayed, arrested, and put to death and rose from the grave. But we need to look at the words of what Jesus said to Peter in the upper room when Jesus gave the Lord's Supper at the time of the Last Supper that Jesus ate with them before he was put to death. Jesus had warned his disciples in the upper room on the night he was betrayed that, he, that they would all fall away on account of him. And we find these words of Peter, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. He's probably talking about all the other disciples. Even if all these other disciples fall away because of what happens to you, I'm not going to fall away from you, Jesus. But Jesus answers, I tell you the truth, Peter. This very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Peter was trying to reassure Jesus that he, his love for Jesus was so great that he would never leave him. And yet we know what happened a few short hours after Jesus spoke these words. Jesus went with his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane. And there Jesus was betrayed and arrested. And then he was led off to the home of the high priest. And Peter followed behind. When Jesus was taken indoors to be questioned, Peter stayed out in the courtyard, warming himself by the fire. And as he stood around and waited to see what would happen, different people came up to Jesus, or to Peter rather, and asked Peter, aren't you with that man, Jesus? Aren't you one of his disciples? And Peter denied it. No, I don't know the man. I'm not with him. But the people kept coming back to Peter and asking him, wait a second, you are with him. You're a Galilean. And before long, we find Peter denying knowing Jesus and calling curses down on himself and swearing to them, I don't know the man. And meanwhile, the rooster crowed the second time. And Peter thought of the words of Jesus, and he went out and he wept bitterly. And so that happened before Jesus died. And now Jesus meets with his disciples again after he rose from the grave. And he picks out Peter to talk to him. 
and he asked Peter this question. Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Do you truly love me more than these other disciples who are here? And Peter answers, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But Peter does, or Jesus doesn't leave it at that. He asks him a second time, do you really, truly love me? And Jesus is using the word for love, the Greek word agape, which means that truly deep kind of love, that kind of love that is undeserved, that has no end involved, the kind of love that Jesus has shown us by dying on our, for our sins on the cross. The kind of love that Peter expressed to have earlier when he said, even if all the other disciples leave you, I will never leave you. Jesus asked Peter, do you have that kind of love? When Peter answers, he uses a different kind of love. He uses the word for brotherly love. The kind of love that we have for our friends, the people that we care about. But it's not as deep as the agape love. You know that I love you. Jesus answers, feed my lambs. But Jesus asks the second time, do you have this true deep kind of love for me that you declared earlier? And again, Peter says, I, I love you as a friend. This time Jesus tells him, take care of my sheep. But Jesus doesn't let it go at that. He asks the third time, do you love me as a friend? And we're told that Peter is hurt by this question. And of course, maybe as this question keeps coming back, do you truly love me? Peter is thinking about the time when he was standing outside the courtyard of the high priest's home, denying that he even knew Jesus, much less was his friend. And so Peter is hurt. But he says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus tells him again, feed my sheep. It's quite a question that Jesus asked Peter. Do you really love me? Do you really have this kind of love that you proclaim to have for me? Jesus is having Peter look deep into his heart, isn't he? You bragged and boasted about the kind of love that you would have for me, and yet you deserted me. You denied knowing me. What kind of friend are you? We find Peter not no longer bragging about his love, no longer talking about himself, but now he talks about Jesus and said, You know, you know me, Lord. You know that I love you. You know that I follow you, but you know me better than I know myself. And, of course, that is the truth, isn't it? It, was, it might be easy to condemn Peter for denying knowing Jesus in that courtyard. But, of course, we have to look at ourselves if we're going to look at him. We have to ask ourselves, how would we have acted if we had been in Peter's sandals there, being questioned by the enemies of Jesus, whether we are with that man, Jesus? I don't know about you, but I think it's easy to say that we often deny knowing Jesus. How often it is that we don't say the things, the good things that we should say because people might make fun of us. Or we do follow the crowd, rather, because we want to fit in, even though we know that it will displease our God. Oh my goodness, how many times don't we deny being a Christian? I mean, after all, if we call ourselves a Christian, we mean that we follow Christ, meaning that we love him, and we want to obey him, and obey our Heavenly Father, and all that he commands us to do, and yet we fail. 
we don't live as God's child. We don't show Jesus our love and concern. We deny knowing him. We deny being a Christian sometimes with our lives and the things we say. Sometimes we aren't there to stand up for Jesus and our holy God. And of course, what do what should happen to us because of that? Unfortunately, because of our own sins. We deny ourselves a place in heaven. And oftentimes we talk about the punishment of sin being eternal damnation, being separated from God, not being allowed into his heaven, but being but being forced to live in hell. But it's not so much that God has closed the gates of heaven to us. No, it's ourselves that have slammed the doors shut to heaven every time we deny him, every time we disobey him, our holy God, and Jesus as a brother. Now, instead of finding the gates of heaven open to us because of our sins, we have closed the gates of heaven and we find the doors of hell wide open, waiting for us to enter. Because of the many times that we have sinned against our holy God and deny being a Christian in by the things that we do and say. Yes, we might say that we're a Christian and then we act the opposite. So if the gates of heaven are slammed shut to us by our own deeds, what can we do? Well, it's a good thing that God does love us with an undeserved love that we cannot merit or deserve or work for. It's a good thing that God has sent us his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And that's what he's done. So we don't need to despair. Our Savior, Jesus, has come. We know what he did. He came to our world, lived as the perfect Son of God, obeyed God's will perfectly in his life, in our place. When he came into our world, we are told that he was tempted to sin just as we are. But with one big difference, he didn't sin. He lived the perfect holy life that we, as God's children, should have lived. And then he went to the cross and suffered the punishment that we deserved. The wages of sin is death, eternal damnation, eternal separation from God. But instead of giving us that punishment that would have bound us in hell, God sent his son Jesus and punished him, bound Jesus in hell, separated himself from hell, uh, Jesus, gave him our punishment so that the gates of heaven could be opened. What does scripture say? Ah, the blood of Jesus, which purifies us from every sin. Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Yes, the gift or the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus died on the cross in our place for our sins. And then he was buried. But we know that three days later he came back to life again. Jesus lived again to show that our sins are paid for, to show that he is our savior from sin, to show us that we too will rise again from the grave and live with our heavenly father in the mansions of heaven because now the gates are open. You see, Jesus is the key. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father except through Jesus. And that message of Jesus and what he's done for us to save us from our sin. That's the 
key of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is the key. Without him, we can't enter. Without him, the gates are closed because of our sins. But Jesus has taken away our sins, and the doors of heaven are open wide to us. Not because of ourselves, not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done there for us. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What a blessing. Jesus has opened the doors of heaven for us. Now we might ask ourselves, okay, Jesus has used this key for us. He has come to be this key that makes us right with God again. But how can he but can he really use us? I mean, after all, we're the ones that slammed the door in his face, the door of heaven, that is. But just as Jesus could use Peter, so he can use us. He told Peter, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. What's the food that Jesus is talking about? It's the word of God. And the two main teachings of the word of God the law and the gospel. Those are the two main teachings of the Bible. The law which tells us how to live our lives and how God wants us to live. The law which shows us our sin and our need for a Savior. And then the gospel, the second main teaching of the Bible. The gospel which shows us Jesus, the love of God, who takes away the sin of the world. The love of God, which shows us everything that God has done for us, is doing for us, and will do to save us from our sins, and so that we have a home with him in heaven. Yes, Jesus could still use Peter to feed his people. Oh yes, the word sheep. Jesus isn't talking about animals, he's talking about people. People. I don't know, I've never raised sheep. But I hear that they need a shepherd. They need someone to guide them, someone to help them, someone to show them where the good grass is that, so they can eat, someone to show them where the, the good water is to drink, someone to guide them away from dangers and protect them. Sometimes the shepherd has to save the sheep from itself because I understand that sheep like to wander off, stray, get lost, and they can have trouble finding their way back to their flock. That describes us, doesn't it? We need help, us human beings. We don't always listen to God or his word. We get lost in temptations of this world. We don't always follow Jesus, but, but God has given us his word. So we can find our way back to him. So we know about God's great love for us. So we know the way to heaven through Jesus. So that's the key that God has given to us by forgiving us our sins and our Savior Jesus Christ. And now God wants us to serve others. The ministry of the keys of the kingdom of heaven. To be a minister means to be a servant. To serve others. And how can we serve others? We can be like Jesus in a sense. We can be a shepherd to others by showing them how to get to heaven. By showing them, by telling them that even though they've sinned against their holy almighty God, that Jesus has come to die for their sins as well. This is how we as Christians live with other Christians. This is how we as Christians live with other people, whether they're Christians or not, believers or unbelievers. You see, when, others, people, when other people insult us or hurt us or harm us, we don't have to look for revenge, try to get back to them for what they've done. And we have a heart like the heart that Jesus had for us. 
Just as Jesus forgave us our sins, we are ready to forgive them, our neighbor, their sins. Or our husband, or our, our wife, or our children, or the people that we work with. We know that people are going to hurt us because they're sinners. And we know that we're going to hurt them because, because we are sinners too. We don't always have that perfect, undeserved kind of love that, that God wants us to have. But thanks be to God, he has a, a love for us that we don't deserve. And he's shown us through, shown, has shown it to us through Jesus. And that's the kind of love that God wants us to use with others. Having a heart that's ready to forgive those who sin against us. Because we know that Jesus didn't die just for me or just for you. He died for the sins of the whole world. When someone sins against us, we need to remind ourselves, Oh yeah, Jesus died for this sin that this person has just committed against me. Because any sin that any person commits against anybody is also a sin against our holy God. And if God can forgive them, then I too can forgive them, because Jesus has first of all forgiven me. Through Jesus, the doors of heaven are open to me, and I need to tell this person who has sinned against me, you're forgiven, and the gates of heaven are open for you because of Jesus who died on the cross for your sins. So that's a tool. The key of the kingdom of heaven is a tool that God has given us to use to live in this world and to give us a home in heaven. And of course, we, when we as individual Christians get together, as we do in a church, we use that, that, that tool once again. When there's someone in our church who has fallen away from God with their life, who's living in sin, who's unrepentant for what they've done, then we have given the right to our church leaders to go to them and use the law to point out their sin and the way that it separates them from their God and binds them as a prisoner for, for hell so that the person can listen to the sweet gospel message that their sins are forgiven, their chains that bind them to hell and Satan are loosened and heaven is at home. Their sins are forgiven. It's only if that person is unrepentant, refuses to see their sin, refuses to believe in Jesus for their forgiveness, refuses to believe in him as their savior, that then their sins remain in place and the gates of hell remain closed because they refuse to believe in the key, the one who has come to open heaven for us all. So here we do see the ministry of the keys at work. Jesus reinstated Peter. He forgave Peter his sins. He showed him that the doors of heaven were open and that he could still use him in his kingdom here on earth by sharing the message of God's word and love that Jesus is the key to heaven and forgiveness. Peter declared to love Jesus. And in our reading here, Jesus predicts that Peter will have opportunity to show his love. Peter said to Je Jesus said to Peter, rather, I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Jesus predicted that Peter would die as a martyr, as a Christian, as one who was proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, as one who was sharing the key of the kingdom of heaven to others. Because not everyone wants to hear that word. 
It shows us too that even for us as Christians, even though our sins are forgiven, even though the gates of heaven are open to us, that there will be times in this life, in this world, when we will be persecuted because of our Christian faith. When we stand up for Jesus, when we want to do the right thing and live as a child of God, people will ridicule us and make fun of us. And in some places in the world, perhaps put us in prison or even put us to death. But let, let's not let that stop us from following Jesus. Follow Jesus, he says. Follow me, Jesus said. Sure enough, hard, difficult times might come because of our faith in him. In this world, in this life. But we know that the kingdom of heaven awaits us. That the doors of heaven are wide open, waiting for us to follow, to finish our path through this life. And there we can find rest for our souls, eternal rest for our souls. And the eternal joy and peace that God has prepared for us. What a blessing to know Jesus. What a blessing to be a Christian. What a blessing to know that we have the key that opens heaven for us. What a blessing to know Jesus as the key and the way, the truth, and the life. Heaven is ours. Amen.